Cool, so this was the most asked about question for the workshop. And this is question nine from last week, so it was workshop one, so I'm calling this question 1.9 um, in the voting process. Some air is trapped at some pressure and some temperature. The piston has some mass. Initially it's supported on stop, so the implication here is that the red piston will come lower and repressurize that air up higher than it is currently pressurized, but it's being held on stops. Um, heat is being transferred as Q into the air, and it's reaching some temperature. And how much heat is transferred in that process, right? And heat will be transferred into this. Now, the question here is, potentially, the air will be heated enough so that the red piston can lift off the stops. So it's either going to be isochoric, the piston's going to stay in place, and the air will just remain the same volume and it'll have isochoric heating. That would be nice. My feeling is that it's not going to be that, just my inclination looking at this question, is that there's going to be some isochoric heating where the piston won't move, and then we're going to continue heating, the pressure's going to exceed what it takes or match what it takes to lift the piston, then the piston's going to lift up until the heating process finishes. Now, if the first part of that process is isochoric, the volume doesn't change, what can we say about the rest of the process? So while the piston's in the process of being lifted by the air, isobaric, can you put some words around why? Yeah, temperature's increasing and volume's increasing. Why doesn't pressure change? Okay, it's good. Anything else? Someone said isobaric. Yeah, go. There's nothing holding the stops down because I have no weight, so going to Yes, okay, good. I'll take that. So we look at what is causing pressure in the cylinder. And the things that are causing pressure in the cylinder when, there's, when the piston is free of the stops is the mass or the weight force, like mg, right? The, the weight force of the piston itself and the atmospheric pressure that is sitting on top of the, the piston. And so no matter how high the piston rises, that pressure is the same. So it will be isobaric. So as the piston lifts, the pressure will be constant. Uh, when the piston rests on the stop, the pressure inside can potentially be uh, lower than that pressure. So we've got some critical pressure of lifting. And then, um, so let's, so now we've, thought about it, and this is kind of an answer to your question about how do you know what process you're doing. The answer is you look at it and go, what's happening? And then, and then you get a sense for it. So let's, uh, let's write out some things. Cool. Good. That's good for you. Rio, so what do we know? Things that we know. We have some volume one. We have some pressure one. We have some temperature one. We have a piston mass and a piston height. And we have a final temperature. Now, my feeling is this is going to be a two-step process. It's going to heat up isochorically and then um, heat up isobarically. So I'm going to call this T3 equals 4 That's my feeling on that. The next thing I can do is chart the process. And I've kind of, to you, charted it with my fingers and my hands, but let's do it uh, graphically so we get a sense for it. Uh, let's label that. <laughs> well, I feel like it's going to start at state one, 
it's going to increase in pressure. Sorry, that's P V. So it's going to start at state 1, it's going to increase in pressure to state 2, at which point it exceeds the pressure or equals the pressure at which the piston can lift, and then it's going to come across and go to state 3. And that's my process chart. All right. And then, what do we want to find? We want to find Q1 to 3, which equals Q1 to 2, plus Q2 to 3. So whatever heat it takes for that isochoric um, process, plus whatever take it, heat it takes for the isobaric <laughs> process. Cool. Everyone okay with how I've set the question up so far? Uh, if I remember correctly, if the internal energy of the system doesn't depend on the path. Yes, that's right. So U is independent <coughs> of the path, that's right. It's just heat it does. Yes. So Q is path dependent, but U is not path dependent. U is a state variable. Go. Uh, could you explain uh, the process from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 again? Yeah, sure. No worries. So I don't know, but I suspect. Like, if. Let's just take uh, the initial conditions. Let's take a cylinder sitting on the stops at 100 kPa and 23 degrees C, and let's add just a little bit of heat, make it, make it just a little bit, of, a little bit hotter. Then I would expect that it's going to get hotter, the pressure's going to go up, because PV equals MRT, so if you're increasing temperature, then pressure must go up to maintain the same volume. All right? Now, as temperature goes up, pressure also goes up. Right? And then, if we add enough heat, maybe we don't, I don't know. But if we add enough heat so that the pressure exceeds the pressure <coughs> required to lift the red piston off the stops, then the red piston starts to lift up. And now, as we continue to increase temperature, pressure is remaining constant, but it's volume that's changing. So PV equals MRT. So now volume is increasing as temperature increases and pressure stays the same. So that's how I got this chart. We've got some isochoric heat addition process and then some isobaric heat addition process. Does that get it? Good, excellent, good. Thanks for asking for clarity, I appreciate that. Yes, go, oh, Mary. Um, why did you draw the heat curve? Pressure temperature? Yeah. Yeah, could have done. Do you want me to? Is it just only important to make sure this is, uh, make sure the states are not dependent on each other? If there's two phases, then pressure temperature won't work. So you want, hang on, wait, wait, wait. Let's just, let's just answer that question. So you want temperature rise while pressure rises, and then you want temperature rise while pressure stays, no. You want temperature rise while pressure rises, then you want temperature rise while pressure stays the same. <coughs> that feels linear. <coughs> cool. Having drawn that, yes we can. And I think going to your point, because these are two independent no, okay, intrinsic okay. variables. If you were to be a, if you were to be two phases, then that wouldn't work. No, that's true. But we're talking about ideal gases. We, we, we're getting to pure. Um, we're getting to phases later. Like, can I add a comment? Yeah, Matthew would like no, to. Just the graphs. You can draw both. You can also draw a V and T diagram, but you'll find in almost every case that your first one, your PV, is the most useful. Um, because when Phil goes back across... Oh, sorry. I'm just drawing a TV to illustrate uh, your point. So in this, we can very clearly see the work that's been done in the process. So in here, the area underneath any part of this line is the work done during those stages. None of these other graphs have got a similar thing, but you can clearly see here. So for instance, from 1 to 2, we can straight up see from this graph that there's no work because there's no area underneath the line. Whereas from two to three, all this big rectangle is the work done. So that's why yeah. that graph is so useful compared to these two where you can see what's happening, but it doesn't give you any extra information. Yep? Does it make a difference that in this case we use like volume versus specific volume in the last? No. <coughs> so Good question. The only, when you've got specific volume, you'll get work per unit mass. Whereas if you use active volume, you'll get the total amount of work done. Yep. Pe people who are paying attention will notice that I've used lowercase 
throughout here, so lowercase v, lowercase w, such that you can tell the difference between lowercase and uppercase w. Over here, I'm using uppercase q, because over here we didn't have enough information to determine the extensive values, only the specific values, but over here we've given a volume proper, we're given a volume, so we can do extensive values, uppercase q's, masses, yeah. If it had given you the specific volume, if it had given you this volume up here is you know, 0 0.125 you know, per kilogram, uh, what's that, meters cubed per kilogram, for example, right? If it had given it to you in specific terms, then you could only determine it in specific terms, and all these terms would be lowercase. But it might still say, determine the heat for the process, but your answer will be in kilojoules per kilogram. Yeah. So if you're given the extensive terms, use them. Otherwise, go back to uh, intensive terms. And the reason for that on, on a subject-wide level, because we haven't gotten there yet, right? But the reason for that on a subject-wide level is if we say, for example, we're analysing a, a steam power plant, right? We could determine in, with a steam power plant how many kilojoules per kilogram of liquid flow that steam power plant's going to go. And then the government says, make me a 500 megawatt plant and you divide 500 megawatt divided by the number of kilojoules per kilogram and the units are kilojoules per second. Yep, that's good. So kilograms per second. So you say, well then I need devices that can handle 100, kilojoules, 100 kilograms per second flow rate. So you can, you can determine the efficiency and the output of something on a per unit basis and then just scale it up. So it's really useful. So we do a lot in, a, in kilojoules per kilogram. Similarly for a car engine, you're like, okay, well, if I do this kind of cycle, this is what I'll get. Well, how many litres does my engine need to be? Four litres, six litres. Bang, bang, bang. You can just multiply it out. So um, it is quite useful to do things on a specific basis. But if you've been given the volume in absolute terms, in extensive terms, then work out the thing. Good. Did that answer your question then? The reason we're doing the PV chart is because it's useful. The, n the next most useful chart, and possibly more useful later on, is the TS chart, which is temperature and entropy. But I can show you what it looks like, because we haven't done entropy yet. Um, it seems a bit early. Let Always that increasing. cat out of the bag. Well, not on a TS chart, though. Entropy, yes. Wow. So we need to get there. What do you That coming attraction is in week five. I'll keep solving. My eyes are down, so I can't see if you put up your hand. So sing out if there's something else. Right here, now. Let's see now. P2. Yeah, go. Oh, no, is that a hand up? Is that a hand up? No. Good. So how do we know? So there's some pressure at which this piston, this red piston, will begin to rise. And that pressure will be made up of two components. One component is the pressure of the atmosphere bearing down on top of the cylinder. And the other is the pressure associated with the mass of the cylinder. Or the mass of the piston, one should say, sorry, to use correct, correct language. That pressure, the pressure associated with the piston mass, is equal to the force divided by the area over which it bears. The force of the piston is equal to its weight, and weight is m times g, which is 15 times 9 point, call it 8, 1. So we've got 147 newtons of force. The area of the piston is equal to the volume that the piston contains divided by the height of the piston, <coughs> if we allow that it's a cylindrical piston. You're not happy with that? Sorry. No, I, I heard that part. Oh, all right. Um, Good, eh? I was just, I'm trying to Yeah, that's good. Why isn't it already at that? Like, are we like stopping the piston out to the 
Sorry? Yes. Supported by two stops. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. Okay. So right now, in state one, as, as you've shown it, there's some pressure bearing down from the atmosphere. So we'll call that P atmosphere. And then there's some weight force associated with the mass of the piston. And then the force is going up. There's some 100 kilopascal pressure pointing upwards. And then you could say... Each of these stops is supplying some force up. So everything's in static equilibrium mechanically. So are stops like, are stops the thing that they use a lot? Like, is that just, like, do they just randomly put that there? Like, mm, yeah, in this, in this question, it's just an artifact of the question. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so cylinders have cushions. Cylinders can have stops. Directional control valves have stops. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Nope. Stops are a thing. I mean, you know, this is 170 meter tall cylinder, so it's a little bit fabricated, but. Oh, right. So at some pressure, as this pressure increases, as this pressure increases, the stops eventually reach the point where the stops don't, aren't supporting any force at all, and then any additional heating of the air inside the cylinder will cause this to rise until all the forces equalize again. No, it's fabricated. It's just a question. This is week two. We will analyze car engines in week seven. They use pistons. Don't know. Oh, because the maths works out really well. It's quite a, it's quite a, you know, all this will work out. And you'll say, aha, ready, good. So we have the volume, meters cubed. We have the height, 170 meters. The area of the piston must therefore be very small. Zero point. The problem that we're facing is that air pressure is higher than you think it is. So we can make the piston unreasonably heavy and the area could be slightly larger, the surface area could be larger. Um, but if you've only got a 15 kilogram piston, then you need a very small area. Cool. So now we've got the area of the piston and we've got the force of the piston. So now we say, what's the pressure? associated with the piston, and that is force divided by area, which is 0 0.147 kilonewtons divided by 0 0.01. Uh, you notice that I went from newtons to kilonewtons. Here you go. Yep, so yes. So we're going pressure of atmosphere plus pressure of mass. Here we're just doing the pressure associated with the mass of the piston. Yep, so we'll get there. I've converted from newtons to kilonewtons because I want an answer in kilopascals. And that comes out to close enough round figures 100 kPa. So then the pressure at which the piston will lift, which is P2, is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. We'll call the pressure of the atmosphere 100 kPa. Actually, for your purposes, because you're learning, you should learn it properly. 101.325 kPa plus round figures 100 kPa. So the pressure at which that lifts is 201. There. Oh. Two. So if we, could, if we heat the air in the cylinder, then we'll get to some pressure at which the piston will rise. 
And then the question can become, well, so if we looked back at our PV chart, now we know this pressure, which is P2 and P3 at the same time. Now the other thing that we need to know, to know all, where all the dots on this chart are, is what is then V3. And V3 we can determine, so we can say to find V3, we know that from the combined gas law, P1, V1 on T1 equals P3, V3 on T3. Okay? This comes about because PV equals MRT. Right? Mm, how can I, you know, eat, write that? You can take T1 over the other side of the equation and say P1 V1 equals T1 equals P3 V3 on T3. So if you don't have any mass changing within the system, so if it's a closed system, then the combined gas law lets you do that. Or you can calculate it directly. Six to one. So we can make V3 the subject of this equation, and we can say V3 equals P1, V1, T3 on T1, P3. T3 was 700. T1 was 296. P3 was 201. Yeah, go. Uh, why is P1 100? Shouldn't P1 just be the atmospheric pressure? It's a great question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, air is trapped in a cylinder at a pressure of 100 kilopascals. Oh, okay. Mm. It's a given. It could be 20 kilopascals. You know, this, this air, you could have this running at a functional vacuum, and the stops would be supporting lots of force. You know, there's not very much air in it. Excellent. People happy with the combined gas law? Use the combined gas law. Good. My calculations, I used slightly different numbers. Um, and I was a little bit more precise, but I got zero point oops, in black. I got zero point two nine three five four eight. Cool. I'm working to six decimal places and then reporting my final answer to four decimal places. I, I feel like that's about right. Cool. So now we've got all of the things that we need to to fill out our lovely chart, right? Now, we need to use our first law of thermodynamics for closed systems. So, we say delta U from 1 to 2 equals Q, 1 to 2 minus W, 1 to 2. That feels right. Matt helpfully told us that there was no work associated with process 1 to 2 because it's a vertical line on our PV chart. Right, the piston's not moving, there's no boundary work, there's no fan inside the space, there's no electrical heater, there's no work. So therefore, Q12 equals delta U12 equals M. What's the equation for delta U? Good, happy with that. CV, T2 minus T1. We haven't calculated T2. We don't need to, as it turns out. Now, delta U for process 2, 3 equals Q2, 3 minus W2, 3. Can we cancel work out again? No? Good. Excellent. So let's rearrange Q2, 3 as the subject of that equation. Equals MCV T3 minus T2 plus work for an isobaric process is pressure. In this case, I'm going to denote it pressure 2. I could denote it pressure 3 because it's isobaric. Go. Uh, CP is isobaric. 
Yes. Good. So, yep, yep, good. Um, let me just finish writing this out. V3 minus V2. Right. Good. What was your name? Uh, Justin. Just, good, good. I'm just trying to learn. Um, so, Justin pointed out, and it's a good point, radio, this will also equal MCP T3 minus T2. Okay? So, his point was that process... 2, 3 is isobaric, and so therefore, you don't need to have a delta U term and a work associated with um, moving boundary work term. You can wrap that all up into one term and just call it MCP. Um... Yeah, that's what you just said, didn't it? <laughs> oh, that's what Justin meant to say. It's good though, right? Like, this is good. So, delta U is always associated with CV, okay? Um, if you wanted to take into account the work term, then you'd have to drop this out, and this together would be delta H23, which equals the CP. Nod your head if that made sense. Shake your head if it needs more explanation. I can see some imperceptibly small nods, so I'm going to go with nod. Cool. We could use this method, uh, and you could at home. The thing that we don't have for this method is we don't currently know T2. But we could work out T2. We could work out T2 using the combined gas law. We could say P2, V2 on T2. We know that V1 and V2 are the same thing. So T2 is just twice T1. So let's, let's run them both. Let's run them both. Let's run my solution in black and Justin's solution in green. Equals. So my solution would be to say, uh, you've got Q12 and you've got Q23, so therefore Q13 equals Q12 plus Q23 equals MCV T2 minus T1 plus MCV T3 minus T2 plus P2, V3 minus V2. Um, now I can reconcile these first two terms to just say M, C, V, T3 minus T1. Because they didn't know T2 anyway. Seems like I'm going to uh, do less calculations that way. And I know both P2, or all of, P2, V3, and V2, which is good. Uh, what's the thing I don't know in this whole equation? It's one term I don't know yet. <coughs> yes, that's right, it's mass. <laughs> so we need to come back up here and, and work out mass now. From PV equals MRT, M equals PV on RT. I can choose that at any state. I'm going to choose it at state 1. Equals 100 times 0 0.25 divided by 0 0.2870 times T1 was 296. And I got a mass of 0 0.294135. Five kilograms. So that's the mass of air in the piston. People are getting antsy. It's getting close to the hour, but I want to watch. The, I want to go through this, and then we'll do workshop time after, right? So, eh. and we can decide as a as a group whether we feel like this is a valuable use of our time together, or whether you want less of this and more workshop. Anyway, we'll we'll negotiate that. 
So this is 0 0.25. Drat. Oh, there it is. 2.94135 times CV for air is 0 0.18 times T3 was 700 minus 296 plus P2 was 201.325 volume 3 was 0 0.25 293548 minus volume 1 which is 0 0.25, which was 85 point. Three two kilojoules plus which is funny. I didn't end up doing that maths. Call it 94. Oh, did you say? Because the answer's over there. 94, there you are. Cool. So that's the black way of doing that. The other way of doing this is to say, well, if T2 equals, what's double 296? 500, there's going to be 2 there, feels like there's going to be a 9 there. So knowing T2, we could have said, well, Q13 equals Q12 plus Q23 equals MCVT2 minus T1 plus MCP, because it's a constant pressure process, T3 minus T2. And that will give you, you can take out mass as a common denominator, 0 0.2, 9 something, CV will be 0 0.718, you'll have T2 which was 596 minus 2, oh, 592 minus 296, then you'll get CP which is 1.005, T3 which is 700 minus 592. And you'll find that'll come out to be 94 kilojoules as well. So that would be Justin's method for solving the same problem. That's a work solution to the most voted for question from last workshop, 1.9.